Welcome to the School of Architecture at the University of Queensland's public lecture series, North by Northwest, Local and Global Architectural Culture, hosted by the State Library as a component of their year-long Asia-Pacific Design Library lecture series. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers, Stevens Lawson Architects, who are a multi-award winning architectural practice based in Auckland, New Zealand. Their work covers a wide spectrum of scale and typology from small scale artist studios, residential projects, cultural facilities, and an ur urban homeless housing project. Nicholas and Gary tonight will discuss explorations into placemaking and regional difference within contemporary architectural culture and explain their design approach through a range of built and unbuilt projects across New Zealand. They have entitled their lecture tonight, Genius Loci. Please join with me in welcoming Gary Lawson and Nicholas Stevens. Oops. Thanks, Andrew. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you very much for inviting us to Brisbane. We have never been to Brisbane before, and neither of us, and for a few years now we've been hearing whispers that there's something really interesting happening here, so we thought we'd check it out. So um, we had a really great day today walking around Brisbane, and you know, we've probably got sunstroke, but um, you know, we're, not, we're not blushing, we're, uh, we're glowing. We're, uh, we're not used to these kind of temperatures. However, I know this is nothing for you guys. But um, we went to the 21st century show at Goma and we've been conducting a little bit of uh, uh, commercial office building foyer comparative research today. And we've been looking at the, uh, some Harry Seidler majestically elegant office foyers and, we've, and we visited a Donovan Hill uh, for you for the new Santos building, which was, I've got to say, was just exquisite. Uh, exquisite interiority and warmth and intimacy. And, uh, yeah, we were, you know, we've, we've found some very interesting stuff here. I also learned a, a new term in architecture today, uh, which is matchstick mannerism. Do you guys know this? Because apparently this is, this is what happens in Queensland, mainly. But um, we feel it kind of describes our work too, so you know, we now know what to call it. So enough about you guys. Uh, we need to tell you something about us. So um, while we're here, my name is Nicholas Stevens. This is Gary Lawson, and he's going to kick things off. Thanks for having us. We've entitled this talk about our work, Genius Loci, a Latin term meaning the spirit of place. It was a term elaborated within the context of architecture by the theorist Christian Norberg Schultz in his book Genius Loci Towards a Phenomenology of Architecture. Now to quote Norberg Schultz, identity means primarily that one defines and develops one's own local characteristics, while freedom means, amongst other things, a quality of opportunity to play one's part in a greater context. We would like to talk about our work in relation to this concept. In the face of the unrelenting forces of globalisation, we are seeking an identifiable position for New Zealand architecture within world architecture. And what's more, we're looking for regional differences to inform and generate further distinctions. In other words, we're trying to build an architecture which creates a sense of place specific to New Zealand as a country, but also to particular locations within New Zealand. It's not a new idea. Kenneth Frampton's concept of critical regionalism as resistance to universal modernism covered this ground back in the 70s, but we feel it's as relevant today as it was then. There's a groundswell of inventive architecture appearing around the world that is infused with a specific sense of place and local culture history. And we're thinking here of architects such as Mansilla Tunyon in Spain, Peter Zumthor in Switzerland, and Peter Rich in Africa. Paying attention to regional distinctions offers us fertile ground to explore such difference, 
to draw out subtleties and idiosyncrasies particular to a place and to experiment with how architecture might capture and express such distinction. The challenge is to create an architecture that somehow represents New Zealand's unique qualities and identity while not rejecting what the world and contemporary society has to offer. This challenge is not New Zealand's alone, and as Australian architect Kevin O'Brien writing in Monument earlier this year observed, in the Australian landscape, the old architectural paradigms continue to flounder. The answer is not in rehashing an imported sensibility ad nauseum, but in realising the very essence of the land. And this comment was made in regard to his proposition that much of Australian architecture is also suffering from a lack of local expression and identity. He goes on to explain the Aboriginal concept of country as being different to countryside, instead relating to the wider concept of country as a holistic concept of landscape, culture and spiritual force. Back home in New Zealand, the Māori have several concepts that encompass the idea of genius loci, the strongest being that of manawa whenua, referring to the heart of the land or the spiritual dimension of the land. Reference to one's Turangi Waiwai is translated as a place to stand, referring specifically to one's identity and being able to stand on one's own whenua or land. These concepts are gathered together in the marae, which as a grouping of buildings around an open space is completely about reflecting the spirit of place. But the references and links are multiple and varied. Just as rich and important to New Zealand's built history as Māori architecture is, so too are the early colonial settlers' buildings. Often built purely from need and in reaction to climatic extremes and available materials, wool sheds, cottages and dams are rich expressions of our combined culture and history. We see our work as trying to define a sense of local character while also, to paraphrase Norberg Schultz, play our part in a greater context. As such, our work attempts a progressive synthesis of looking back while looking forward. So I don't know how much you guys know about New Zealand architecture, but there are several key figures who we are particularly interested in and whose work from the 1950s and 60s and 70s continues to inform ours. So this is a slide of work by... There was an architectural group, and they called themselves The Group. And um, they, they, were, they wrote a, a manifesto for New Zealand architecture inspired by rural vernacular architecture, in particular in the 1940s, in the late 40s. So they were very influential in the um, post-war New Zealand scene. And they were progressive and modern, but they were in reaction to international-style modernism. And they were thinking a distinctly New Zealand style of building, a building that was simple, modest, utilitarian, and responsive to our climate and to our culture. And this is a building by Professor Richard Toy, who was an architect and an academic, and he was the head of the Auckland Architecture School for uh, a couple of decades, or he was there for a long time. And he's working mainly in the 50s and 60s, and he, he created some iconic churches which hybridised European and Pacific traditions. So you can see in the slide behind me that the front of this church is very much uh, based around the idea of a Maori meeting house or a whare nui. And with that big sort of welcoming veranda drawing you in and, uh, and that very sort of um, potent space out the front of it. And then next there was uh, John Scott, who was a highly inventive Māori architect who was known for a series of iconic churches and houses throughout the country. And he also fused the language of European and Māori architectural traditions. And in his work in particular, we love the complex diagonal geometries and the intricate patterns and the, and the rich textures. Now, this building behind me now is a building called Futuna Chapel. 
And that is widely regarded by many people, academics in particular, and, and a lot of New Zealand architects as New Zealand's most significant building from the 20th century. And it's very much seen as a, a bicultural building in the, in the fusing of these different traditions. Now this is the work of Sir Miles Warren, who is a sort of a colossus in New Zealand, you know, a colossus of modernist architecture. Um, he's a guy now in his 80s, and um, he's, I think he's the only architect to be knighted, so that, that says something. And he was known for a series of major public buildings, and uh, the most recognised being the Christchurch Town Hall, which he designed in the early 70s. He's described as a brutalist, but um, his work is far more humanist and more sensual than that would imply. I prefer to think of him as a magic brutalist. And this is the work of Ian Athfield, who, again, he's, he's an iconic figure in New Zealand architecture, whose who's experimental buildings of the 1970s with playful assemblages of forms that did reference early colonial architecture, albeit in a very fresh way, in a very novel sense of materiality. It was sort of like colonial crossed with Greek islands. But, um, you know, highly original and... Um, you know, to this day, I'm, I'm, these buildings continue to sort of surprise and delight me. So this gets us to what we do, and we're aiming to create original work with multiple interpretations, which is rich in associations and has relevance to our culture and our landscape. We're not purists, but we're rather interested in the architecture of association and relation we say our practice is a laboratory where we combine different influences and ideas. We draw from disparate sources, some within architecture, some outside. We look at nature, history, craft, cinema, sculpture, carving, even origami. And we're interested in creating combinations that have a strange beauty, not a jarring, warring of influences. We feel beauty needs constant reinventing to remain uh, to remain potent and alive. And as my fashion designer friend says, you need the right amount of wrong. Remember that. <laughs> so we sometimes use nature metaphors, but uh, hopefully not in a simplistic way. We're always looking to abstract these forms and patterns, to translate them, to architecturalize them, through origami, for instance, a language of folding. And as we began to work throughout New Zealand, we began to think more about why do we build this building in this place for these people. A suburban house in Auckland should not look or feel like a holiday house on the South Island. So how could we express these regional differences? So when we start a project, we look around for something relevant or local to respond to. The result is not necessarily contextual in a traditional sense, but we think deeply about how we relate to context and what the building is saying. We want the architecture to resonate with association, to be at once unusual, sometimes even startling, and yet totally right at the same time. To create something new yet strangely familiar. It's important to emphasize the critical in critical regionalism. But ultimately, we want our buildings to sit in the landscape with grace, and for that matter, in the suburbs and the city. So a little bit about our practice. We were established, or well, we established the practice nine years ago. We have a staff of nine people. We're based in Auckland, and we work throughout New Zealand. And we do a wide range of work, and as uh, Andrew has pointed out, everything from outer studios to large-scale public buildings. And Gary and I design collaboratively on all projects. So we're going to show you a wide range of our work, from the small to the large. Some of it's built, some of it's being built, some of it's in development. And we'll focus mainly on the genesis of the ideas behind the work, and we're not going to dwell too much on the technical aspects that we all know that we have to deal with in this business. 
Jerry. Thanks, Nico. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the, the first project we'll talk to you about tonight is called the Onatangi Beach House. Now this black timber house is situated beside a rocky outcrop at the eastern end of Onatangi Beach on, um, on Waiheke Island, which is about a 40-minute ferry ride off the east coast of Auckland. It's dug into the base of a steep slope and is partially tucked behind a mature Pahutakawa tree. It's a holiday home for a couple, their children and grandchildren. The main living areas and bedroom are elevated to the first floor of the house, opening onto decks on two sides, affording striking views down the beach and providing a sense of separation from the boating and the beach activities below. The house has an irregular angular form that is responsive to its location and suggests an informality that's appropriate to a beach house. The living spaces form a crescent shape which wrap around the Pahutakawa and enclose an outdoor room with a fireplace. The irregular carved timber fins offer an organic textured quality animating the building edge while providing screening from the road and a sense of enclosure to the upper deck and living areas. Our concept for these fins was to visually link the architecture to the layered mass of the Pahutakawa trees, cliff face and rocky outcrops that are a feature of the site. The simple roof was created from a single tilted plane which has been trimmed to fit the angular plan form and results in, in some unusual interior geometries. In this house we've attempted to create a contemporary beach house with a strong local flavour, a sense of respect for its location and a commitment and craft to, to the delight of timber building. This house is called the Cox's Bay House and it's located on the shores of a tidal mudflat in the upper reaches of the Waitemata Harbour in Auckland. And with this building we were interested in the forms of the driftwood which you find scattered along the shoreline. And working with this metaphor of driftwood <coughs> washed ashore, we designed a sculptural main form that twists and ramps up from the discrete frontage over a cluster of more organic pod-like forms containing bedrooms, lounge, kitchen. It's a four-bedroom family house and it sits amongst a diverse collection of properties on a quiet suburban street. And the particular house was designed to replace a really small and ramshackle house whose previous owner had for some reason covered the entire site in concrete. So we, we planned to design the house around a central circulation spine akin to a, uh, a, a, a sort of sloping concrete boat slip. which we see in the main plan here. So this is the street, and, um, and this is a main sort of sloping, ramping thoroughfare with, with bedroom and, and kind of um, workrooms, uh, lounges and kitchens set into these more pod-like shapes. And in the section you see how the building um, slopes from the street down the site as, as it loses elevation and allowing us to get a two-storied um, segment to, to, the, to the waterfront. It's like a big caterpillar, that section. The new design is sought to establish an interesting connection between architecture and landscape through a series of courtyards, lush gardens, and an integrated approach to the formal qualities of architecture and landscape design. The main living spaces and circulation areas are seemingly held between the pod forms, and they give it a relaxed air and sort of fluidity to the, to the central spaces. Dark timbers, terracotta combine with the ramping floors, sunken seating and hidden doors, and they all combine to, to offer a rich, playful interior. The home also features extensive built-in furniture, shelving units, and a sculptured cantilevered staircase. It's our wave kitchen bench. Frozen wave. Externally, the chamfered black form interacts with the softer textured pod forms to create a challenging and enigmatic adaption of the classic New Zealand timber house. 
And while from the waterfront, the home references to the sort of small-scale vernacular seaside batches, which are such a part of coastal New Zealand. Now, you may have noticed by now that there's something going on with blackness. And there is a New Zealand affinity with things black. The dark side, maybe. Melancholy, maybe which probably requires some psychoanalysis, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, There is a vernacular tradition of black creosote rural buildings, the creosote being the old mixture of tar and kerosene and diesel that they used to pick all the wood with in the old rural buildings to stop it rotting. And there's a a real blackness in the New Zealand native bush. Um, I I don't know how many of you have experienced it, but when you're in the bush, it's actually quite dark, and when you look into it, there's a sense, there's a sort of a... A darkness. It's not at all like Australian bush. There's the black sand of the west coast beaches of the North Island in particular. There's the black of the Sharers singlet. You probably have that here as well. There's the all blacks, which is the, the ultimate in uh, blackness, I guess. But it's not seen as morbid or depressing. It's, it's, the blackness is seen as it's imbued with a quality which is strong and almost spiritual. And in this painting behind us, this is a work of Colin McCann. He's generally regarded as New Zealand's greatest 20th century artist. And I I don't know if... He's a colossus in in New Zealand um, 20th century art. And I don't know if Australia has an equivalent figure. I'm thinking possibly a Sidney Nolan type, you know, with those Ned Kelly paintings. Um, Possibly he occupies that kind of position. But um, McCann painted these primal geometrical landscapes that are overlaid with existential questions. There's a lot of text in his, his work as well. Which, you know, why do existentialists always wear black? So I'm drawn to the brutal yet sublime beauty of his work. I don't know if it totally translates offshore, but um, we feel it has a real architectural resonance And so I'm just going to talk now about the smallest project of the night and one of the smallest projects we've ever done, and it's a studio for an artist. It's located in Onihanga, which is an old working-class suburb overlooking the Manukau Harbour, which is the second harbour of Auckland. I don't know if you know much about Auckland, but Auckland is on an isthmus, and it has a harbour on the Pacific coast called the Waitemata, and a harbour on the Tasman, so the, the, the sea it shares with Australia, which is called the Manukau Harbour. And it, these two harbours almost join up. There's only about two kilometres between them. So it's, you know, it's, quite an, it's a very, very interesting watery kind of landscape. And so this is over on, on the Manukau Harbour, which is sort of generally regarded as the least glamorous of the two harbours. Um, it's a studio and a sort of a part-time home for, for an artist, a painter by the name of Michael Shepard, who's a fascinating man, and he's like an encyclopedia of New Zealand history and sort of marginal histories that he sort of he digs up, and, and he, he uses this in his work. A lot of his paintings, a lot of his paintings embody imagery of New Zealand history, from New Zealand history. So the, the house is, comprises two black timber blocks, Separated by a rusty steel door, it's a it's a McCann, Colin McCann homage. Um, the blank facade, with its illusion of a two-dimensional painting, masks a light-filled angular interior space and a veranda. And the large room functions as a painting studio and a garage for the owner's prized vintage motorcycle. And there's a large wall. It's ten meters long, four meters high and it's illuminated with southern light, which is good for painting, and, and uh, he paints any exhibits in the space as well. And also on that floor, there's a simple kitchen and bathroom and storeroom, and upstairs is a sort of a loft-style bedroom with a, with a terrace off it. And the forms and materials of the house reference New Zealand rural vernacular architecture, and they have a deep synergy with the artist's enthusiasm for New Zealand's history, Michael Shepard really loves the way the veranda end resembles a Maori meeting house that's been halved. 
So the house embodies, I guess, a romantic image of the artist as a man alone. Now the next project I'll talk to you is talk to you about is our largest project. And it's for the Auckland City Mission. So a couple of years ago we won an open competition for a new building for the Auckland City Mission and it's for homeless housing and for targeted social housing in central Auckland. Now the City Mission is an extraordinary institution with a ethos, an ethos, of helping marginalised people, whoever they are. And it's run by an inspired married couple. It's, it's a sort of an offshoot of the Anglican Church, but it's, it's, it's almost um, sort of um, non-religious. Actually, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I, I'd say it's, it's kind of like applied Christianity. Yeah. And... So they don't, they don't actually sell a religious message. They just act in a sort of deeply Christian manner. And it's run by this couple called Diane Robertson and Wolf Holt. And they employ about 100 people. And it operates a drop-in centre and food banks and social services. You know, it's really quite a big organisation. And it has immense community support. It's much loved in Auckland. Um, they lay on a Christmas dinner every year for 2,000 people in the town hall, and it's for people who have nowhere else to go. So it was a very interesting competition in that it required that each team, or that each competitor, put together an interdisciplinary team. So on our team, there was a, a, a prominent Maori architect called Rewi Thompson. There was a clergyman. Uh, there was a property investor and a community organiser. And the brief for the competition really was you know, quite a visionary brief. I don't think you ever, sort of not, you, it's not typical to get a brief like this. And it included uh, creating a highly managed homeless facility, which was geared towards getting marginalised people's lives back on track to actually transform their lives. So it wasn't a place for homeless people just to sleep in, but it had a, a wider function to actually get people in there for a, enough time, maybe a year, maybe two years, um, get people off the drugs, off the alcohol, which is actually a huge part of um, homelessness, and m mental illness is another huge part of it. So there's, there, was, there were f facilities of uh, counselling and, and, and um, you know, psychiatry as well involved in this and it had a medical center. And, but the idea is that after two years, people could be re brought back into the community. So they, they, they would be there, they, would, they might learn to read, they would learn to cook, they would use the internet, there were recreational facilities, they'd be off the drugs, all this kind of stuff. So that, you know, that is the plan, and this facility is designed for that. Um, as well as that, it required 70 apartments for single parent families who were where the single parent is re or training, not retraining, at a tertiary facility. And this because there was just this real need um, that they felt where, where people again get um, caught in a trap, often often mothers, but it wasn't strictly for mothers, uh, where they you know, they have the children and they can never get ahead enough to actually be able to you know, get further education and you know, a better job, etc. And so there was also a medical centre in there and a drop-in centre for social services. And we spent a lot of time consulting with homeless people, with social workers and with the church as well because the, the church of St Matthew's in the city is next door to the city mission. So this was also a large-scale urban regeneration project because um, it takes half a city block and it includes a new public square and it's, and it's built around three heritage buildings as well as a new administration building for St Matthew's Church. So in this picture, the, that low building there is the new admin building for St Matthew's Church and that also acts as one of the sides of the urban square 
which blocks off traffic noise and fumes from the road, which is, is uh, you know, a little bit busy. So we have planning permission for this project. We've worked on it for quite a while, but the recession really slowed it down on, for the funding in the last year or so. But um, it's looking incredibly promising again. Recent information we're very happy about that is going to be reactivated in the, ne in the next few months. So the main ideas that generated the architecture were a respect for the historic St. Matthew's in the City Church. And you can see in this images we have the, the old church modelled. And it's, it's, a great, it's a grand church and it's about 100 years old. By creating a public square between St. Matthew's and the Mission. And we wanted the square to be a vibrant space for the central city community in, in total. It wasn't just for the people who, who went to the church or used this facility. It was meant to be a new public space because the whole idea is that we're trying to stop the marginalisation of people. So the idea is that we wanted to sort of create a real centre that, that the entire community was welcome in and did in fact use. So the idea is that it's a very beautiful square. Um, we created an architectural language that riffed off the church. It's gabled roofs, it's intricate scale, the verticality implicit in, in the composition. It's a sort of a contemporary reinterpretation of Gothic architecture, if you will. We wanted to create a sense of home. You know, this is a, a, a project to house homeless people. We wanted the, the fundamental sentiment of this building to, to, to feel like it was a home. But how do you create a sense of home in a 15-storey building in the city? So we created an urban village with house-like roof forms, and we used textures and timber screens and created a friend to, to create a friendlier atmosphere. And we wanted to express a local identity. We developed a, a language of patterns that had a Pacific sensibility, referencing tapa cloths from the Pacific, Pacific and Maori carvings, tattoos. You know, we, in a way, we saw the, the skin of the building kind of carved or even and tattooed, the way the tattoo can actually uh, create a sense of identity. And there's even references to Colin McCann's Stations of the Cross paintings with the Roman numerals. You know, for us, it's all in there. You know, and we love that, the, um, the sense of the multiple interpretation, not just the single reading. So local identity was important. We wanted to clearly mark and identify the Auckland City Mission within the city as a symbol, and in the same way that the architecture of St. Matthew's in the city, the church, marks its identity. So this project I'm about to talk to you um, about is, is in many ways actually probably a predecessor to the ideas that we've um, explored a lot further in the mission um, and that we, we're we working on, on the idea of a, an identi identifying motif and, and, then, and then using that and distilling it down through the architecture from the macro scale down to the micro. Um, this is a home for a family situated in a quiet street in the inner urban um, suburb of, of, of Hearn Bay in Auckland. And it's made of a combination of honed concrete blocks, dark cedar and oak, and white precast concrete. The, the cast concrete facades act, act simultaneously as a public sculpture, a, a kind of a gift to the street, and has a protective mask for the spaces that are occupied behind. And, and the generating idea for this was really um, taking a tarp pattern and, and making it three-dimensional. The living spaces of the site of the building are, are laid out along the site in a linear progression along its length, connecting the front courtyard garden to the backyard. And the continuous space steps down several levels, allowing the natural slope of following the natural slope of the land and defining distinct living, dining and kitchen areas. Um, it's, it's possible to, to stand in the front yard or the back yard of this house and, and look right through the building, which gives it a, a really um, kind of garden pavilion feel. Um, three bedrooms are located on the top floor, 
uh, with, along with what we call the Sky Lounge, which, which is, is kind of like an evening cocktail sunset lounge um, with fantastic views of the harbour. Um, now, this Sky Lounge space, or sorry, just in the section here, you can kind of see the, the open pavilion ground floor and then the more enclosed bedrooms in the Sky Lounge sitting out in the end here. Um, the Sky Lounge functions as a, as a private living space. Um, which, which has a separate stair, and then there's also another way to get to, the, to this lounge um, through the main bedroom, and the, and the two spaces can be interconnected to either work as a lounge or to work as more like making the main suite and bathroom and, and lounge work as a, a really luxury hotel room. It's fair to say in this building we, we've got quite interested in the idea of visceral qualities of architecture, and you know, engaging not only with visual form but also with sound, touch, and smell. And just regarding this point, Alva Alto said that our senses convey to us the raw material on which our thinking is based. And we really like that um, that connection between the, your senses and, and sensing architecture and, and how that kind of creates an indelible imprint on your mind of a building. So the shapes and textures of this building are contrasted and repeated throughout the house and landscape, creating a sense of harmony, complexity and visual delight. And we've, we've taken the idea of the, the triangulated surface of the tarpa pattern and distilled it down through um, you know, timber screens and, and separating, dividing doors, the front door, ceilings um, and, and various features. So these triangular geometries repeated establish an integrated theme that engenders a kind of personal character to the house and, and, a, and a real sense of identity. It's the Sky Lounge. I guess the parting shot for this house is... Um, it really is a house that wears its South Pacific heart on its sleeve. Okay, the next project is a project we're currently in the resource consent phase for, and it's a private hotel in central Auckland. It incorporates 100 guest suites, a reception lounge, cafe, retail and parking. And the design employs an artistic screen to enliven a moribund commercial street manage Seoul again and contribute positively to the local environment. With this project, we've collaborated with eminent New Zealand artist John Reynolds to create a memorable yet understated form for the screens. And we propose a piece of contemporary architecture that reflects the time and the place that we live. Auckland's a modern city of the Pacific, and we really feel that's a quality that we're committed to expressing in our architecture. And writing on the screen design, the artist John Reynolds, with whom we had collaborated, said, Polynesian star maps and tarpa patterns are summoned alongside highly fractured take on the patterning complexities of Murray Dum's tukutuku panel. A further layer of referencing is of drawings by the Spanish poet Lorca of the layered veils falling across the faces of women. Other touch points include the compositional dynamics of Colin McCann's triptych on building bridges, and the winsome engineering of high-fashion Parisian stockings. All this combines in a tense visual play on the mechanics of revealing and concealing. And we can just imagine being in one of those hotel rooms looking out of this steel spider's web and, um, and all these kind of connections racing through your mind. Okay, the next project is the Tomato House, and this is a house that sits on a promontory amongst the foothills of Tomato Peak, which overlooks Hawke's Bay. Hawke's Bay is in the North Island. It's about the halfway down, and it's on the East Coast. This is the site before we built the building. And our clients had run a sheep station in a place called Paronga, sorry, Paronga Hau, which is about an hour and a half south, really, in the middle of nowhere. 
um, for many years, in fact for 30 years, and we're looking to establish a new house at, at Tomato Peak, which is just outside a little town called Havelock North. Very uh, cute little town. And they're also actively involved in the Hawke's Bay art scene as collectors, but also administrators of a, a um, local art prize as well. Now, our architectural response was to try to create a contemporary home that was infused with a sense of the region and the personal history of the family. So, you know, these pictures are of, of you know, vernacular wool sheds, bold, simple, iconic, I guess. Um, here's a picture of John Scott's church. Um, it's another church of John Scott's called Our Lady of Lourdes, which we have always admired, and that was just down the road, and that, that had the sort of bold, angular geometry. And onto the design. So these are the early models of the design. Uh, it comprises three elongated wool shed forms. They're laid askew across the site and connected by wedge-shaped gallery spaces which create forced perspective views into the landscape. So if you look at the, the um, plan here, you can see these gallery forms and if you look in one direction it opens up to the landscape and you look in the other direction it compresses the view down to some detail. It's, um, it's quite dramatic. It's you know, quite effective. Um, there's a series of triangular skylights which echo the rocky outcrops on the peak above and they capture the morning sunlight in the areas of the house which are facing west. Um, there are two courtyards, a motor court and a central courtyard, which are carved out or hollowed out from the shed forms and they create a sequence of interlocking indoor or outdoors and outdoor spaces which you traverse as you walk through the house. The rough black stained timber boards are combined with a natural timber joinery uh, just to create some... One thing when you're dealing with these black houses is you do need some relief. So, you know, the contrast of the, of the uh, natural coloured timber works beautifully against the black. And there's polished concrete floors and there's rusty steel walls as well, which sort of create a sort of an overall kind of earthy feel to the, to the whole place. It's got a robust rural quality to it, to the exterior, but the interior has more of a, sort of a tranquil atmosphere um, and more of a kind of a lightness to it. And there's particular focus on the framing of specific views into the landscape and harnessing the natural light throughout the day. We had really wonderful clients for this project who were incredibly trusting and I'm always, uh, always grateful for how much trust we get from clients because I think when these people came to us wanting a house, they were getting some Auckland architects to come to the Hawke's Bay and I think they thought they were going to get something a bit slick from the city and that's kind of what they wanted. But we talked them through it and we all, you know, we, we got to a place where we said, well, we don't want to do an Auckland house here. We want... We want to do a house, we want to do a Hawke's Bay house, but it's going to be kind of a little bit different from you know, a lot of the Hawke's Bay houses. But in a way, we were embracing something that we loved about the place that maybe they had stopped seeing. And you know, there was a very, very, it was a humorous exchange by, uh, with our client, Bill Mowat, where he's, he said that he's been living on a sheep farm you know, farming sheep for 30 years and we put them in a wool shed. He said, I've been, I've been fighting rust my entire life. You could be rusty walls. And he's kind of laughing about this because, well, you know, that's when you pull out a Ruskin quote because you should always have one at the ready. And I said that rust, in fact, was still in its natural state. And he, he seemed to like that. And, you know, he loves that rust now. I mean, he's, he's, um, he's out there with his garden hose watering it just to get just the right colour. So, you know, that's great. And they've become great friends as well. So, you know, it just goes to show. Um, the final image here has a picture of a bronze sculpture by Paul Dibble, a well-known New Zealand sculptor who does work mainly in bronze. And I'll show you that because it's, uh, it pertains to the next project. 
And this project is, in fact, a house for Paul and Fran Dibble in Auckland, on, on, in one of the North Shore suburbs. And it's a very compact house on a very, very small side. And there's a couple of pictures of the model here, and then we'll show you the pictures of the house under construction, which were just taken about two days ago. Um, it's a cast concrete house. It's cast in pieces off-site, just, just for economic reasons, really. Um, it's the singular material, so it's the, the concrete on the inside, concrete on the outside. It has, we'd like to think it has a sculptural quality. Um, it is for a sculptor, and we sort of would like him to feel that. The... The windows were something we had a lot of fun with, this, this field of, of uh, punctured square windows, kind of a little constellation of squares of different sizes um, that emit, well, they don't emit, they allow shafts of light coming through. And I guess, you know, every architect, you know, in, in, in their, uh, the bottom of their soul always wants to do something a little Lickabusian at some point in their career. So, you know, this was a little opportunity we took. And, uh, you, know, you know, it does bring up the question how, you know, if you've got this attitude of, you know, you want to respond to context in an interesting way and, and a building is built in a, a suburban area where there's about 50 different styles of buildings and all of them are ghastly, you know? How, how do you deal with that? And, of course, that's actually, you know, probably the main condition for, for architecture, really, when you think about it. Um... I'm not sure we totally have an answer to that, but, but probably this building is driven more by the internal logic of the, um, of the sculptor client. And we think it's a small, tough little nugget of a building that uh, we hope should punch above its weight and hold its own amongst all that suburban hodgepodge. Okay, so the... The next house I'll talk to you about is called the Onatangi Clifftop House, and um, it actually sits high up on a, on, a, on a very high headland directly above the Onatangi Beach House, which I presented to you earlier. So the site that we're building on is right where that house there was. Um, it's currently under construction and due for completion early next year. Our thinking for this project was based around a loose interpretation in reference to the ideas of the fortified Māori pa forms historically found on prominent headlands around New Zealand. Um, and we've coupled that idea with, with ideas based on, on collections or clusters of rocks and stones which are found in, in natural landscape environments and beaches such as the site offers. And this thinking has led us to creating a, a building with, a, with an open, organic kind of plan form that explores the idea of fluid space being held between more solid forms. And so the, the final design offers a flowing and boundaryless living space contrasted with more focused and enclosed pod-like retreats for lounge and bedroom areas. And each pod form frames distinct views, um, providing... You know, specific focus to the views within the 270 degree overall view that the site affords. And the atmospheres of the design stay true to the concept with, with a flowing, minimal interstitial space contrasted with textured, woody, and, and really sort of cosy pod forms to create a home offering at once intimacy and a sense of openness to the outside view. The next house I'd like to talk to you about is called Te Kaitaka, and it's a building that's nestled amongst the tussock-covered hills of Roy's Peninsula on the, slopes of, on the shores of Lake Wanaka in the South Island. It's situated on the edge of Te Wahi Panamu World Heritage Area, and it's an area that's renowned for its dramatic landscape with large valleys carved out by ancient glaciers dissecting really, really high mountain ranges, which are often covered in snow. It's an area that's a mecca for outdoor leisure activities, including hiking, fishing, and boating in summer, and in winter, skiing. 
Our approach was to investigate an architectural language in conversation with the natural environment. And here again, Macan's landscapes were, were a touchstone. Abstracted triangulated geometries and origami-like folds and cuts were used to create a sculptural form that relates strongly to the alpine landscape. And this was uh, articulated with, with also with reference to the forms and textures of the vernacular woolsheds of the area. This is a concrete woolshed just up the road. Local planning rules required a building platform that was no greater than 25 metres square. So our design process started with a square piece of paper which we, we folded in origami-like fashion to mirror our reading of the landscape. It was tilted to create a roof plane that mirrored the slope of the land, then trimmed to fit the undulating landforms and to create courtyards to the east and west. And the plane was sliced up on an angle and folded to form skylights and the edges were folded down to form walls enclosing the space within. Now, modelling, and especially the use of what I call sketch models, is a, is a really integral part of, of our practice. Um, Nicholas and I always design using models, and um, it's an incredibly important communication tool for the way that we design together. The model literally sits between us, and... Uh, and it's shaped and formed by us and, and becomes the, the, the basis of our methodology. It's extremely kind of hands-on work, I guess. So throughout our design process, the models are honed and shaped towards the final design. Um, and for me, a great day in the office is spent hunched over a cutting board with uh, a craft knife and a bottle of PVA glue. It's, a, it's become a really great way for us to talk, a uh, design conversation, I guess. It's a free and creative process that deals directly with light, shadow, solid, void, shape and form, and a playful process about exploration and discovery. And one of the important parts of our modelling process is that the models are made and remade, and, and in this way it's a continuous action, a kind of series of changes that take place very consciously in a manner until we're happy with the end result. And this is just a slide of the sequence of, of some of the models that went into this building. In Māori culture, cloak, the cloak, or the kaitaka, is a potent symbol of shelter and nurture. And in this house, we have a skin of natural cedar that cloaks a raw concrete structure, analogous to the tussock draped over the rocky landscape, or perhaps a cloak keeping the elements off your skin. The weathered camouflage exterior gives way to a cave-like interior and the concrete and stone mass providing a sense of protection from the power of the landscape in the extreme regional climate. It's, a, it's kind of an, a, an intriguing but satisfying reversal of the, of the normal orthodox material schema of, of concrete on the outside and timber on the inside. You flip that on its head. The plan of the house um, has the entry area here and stair, kitchen, living, and an outdoor veranda, and diagonally connected a, a kind of sunken lounge area, and then a more private lounge here. And up the stairs is four bedrooms. And the section you see it dug into the site is um, low impact as possible to the to the landscape. The central living area comprises a series of diagonally interlocking spaces which culminate in a cavernous aperture which is carved through to the upper floor, creating a sense of connectedness and spatial fluidity. Shafts of winter sunlight penetrate into the plan through a raised angular skylight and deep-framed windows, evoking an almost spiritual atmosphere. The roof plane dips low, forming a sheltered veranda space, framing beautiful views to the lake and the mountains beyond. And one of the issues with this building was that the, the great views and the land face south and, and the, the skylight was such an important gesture to, to bring much needed sunlight into the house in the winter. The materiality of the building has a tactility and an earthy sensuality expressed by the textured concrete walls, rough hewn schist floors and band soiled oiled timber ceilings. A subtle scent of cedar permeates the space. It's like a tongue twister. The building is enriched by handcrafted detailing, 
and has been assembled with the skill and precision of a furniture maker. The house is a sanctuary for our clients and their family and friends, and although generous in its proportions and theatrical in its expression, it's also an intimate and sociable home with a sense of informality and an atmosphere of serenity. As a sculptural object within the landscape, enfolding a rich interior experience, the house evokes for us quite a profound sense of place. So this is a photograph of the Remarkables. And the Remarkables is the name of a mountain range overlooking Queenstown in the South Island. Queenstown and the surrounding area is the jewel in the crown of New Zealand tourism. I don't know if anyone's been there. A little bit like Queensland in Australia. So about five years ago, we won a national competition for a new cultural centre in the heart of Queenstown, and this was to be named the Remarkable Centre, or Pokapu Kawarau, the Maori name for it. And our design drew inspiration from the jagged mountains with their angular geometries and the white-veined rocks found there. We developed an architectural language of origami-like folds and pleats to create a sculptural composition. This was prior to the design of the previous house, you see. And it was very much, both these projects are inspired by the same landscape. And of course, when we see how that house turned out, we sort of, you know, we're sort of really wishing that more progress had been made on this other project in the meantime, because, you know, it could have been built by now. But uh, there's more to the story. Um, So it was a geometrical abstraction of the mountainous landscape and uh, one that we like to call concrete origami. There actually was something called concrete poetry. um, There was a movement in poetry, which I always thought sounded a little bit like this too. Um, The vast site was given to the council after the old primary school had been moved and it is about 200 metres of street frontage And it's right on axis with the main street which runs down to the wharf and to the lake as well. So if we go to the plan of the project, this this is the plan. And it's a complex that incorporated a 750-seat auditorium, which was for concert music as well as musical theatre, a 250-seat playhouse, a public art gallery, a public library, and these were arranged around a series of urban plazas and landscape courtyards. It also included a community centre, community spaces, dance rehearsal spaces, artist studios, workshops, an underground car park, and a conference centre. It's pretty much everything. You know, every kind of civic and cultural function you could possibly imagine. It was a very ambitious project, and maybe that has been part of the problem for it actually getting off the ground. But um, I'll just talk about the plan briefly. Um, the, the, in the plan, it's, there's a central plaza, which is about a metre above ground level, and that is the sort of main entry to the complex, and behind that is the main auditorium, which sort of anchors the whole composition. Um, to the right is the playhouse, with its own foyer, and to the left is an art gallery. And these are all linked together with a pedestrian-type street, which runs the length of the site, and connects the amphitheater park, which is like an outdoor performance area with a stage as well, um, through to the library right at, right at the other end. And at, at the other end, there's also entrance to the underground car park as well. So. You know, it, it was, uh, it was, there was a lot in there. And uh, so we sort of created this idea of this urban village with paths, courtyards, plazas and landscape. Human-scaled spaces within it. You know, there's, there's, um, there are smaller courtyards which are more intimately scaled, uh, which have a certain sense of warmth and welcome and, uh, and a greater intimacy that would be a pleasure to use and to occupy. 
Now, the auditorium was the centerpiece of the composition. It's the tallest part, and the, the fly tower of the auditorium uh, was right on access with the main road of Ballarat Street. So that sort of that capped the vista when you looked up that road. And it was to work as both a concert hall and a theatre, as I've said. So it had a full fly tower. Um, and with the interior, we employed an architectural language of the same language of the origami folds and pleats, but this time it was in rich toned timber for the interior, so that's kind of more cave-like when you went inside. And the auditorium interior was composed as a collection of irregular-shaped seating terraces which created a sense of intimacy within the audience and provided lateral reflecting surfaces for the dynamic symmetry concert acoustics. Now, we had Marshall Day acousticians, who are New Zealand acousticians um, of international repute, working on this project. In fact, Sir Harold Marshall, it wasn't Sir, Professor Harold Marshall, came back from retirement to work on this project because he, uh, he, had, he, had, um, he had retired to that part of the world. And, uh, but he got excited about this. And the idea, his, his concept of dynamic symmetry is one where you create concert spaces which are not symmetrical, but ultimately the refractions are such that it acts in a symmetrical way, but you get a particular sound quality and you don't, you, you don't get um, peculiar uh, standing wave action, which you, you can get sort of, sort of strange kind of echoes with things that are more symmetrical. Now... He, he's, he's an extraordinary man, um, this acoustician. Um, he's also working on the Paris Opera at the moment. You know, having come back from retirement, then he got called up by Jean, Jean, Jean Nouvelle to, to do the acoustics for the Paris Opera, and that was... The brief for that was they required a radical new acoustic concept, and it was a concept that he had been actually developing in the initial stages on our project here. So, um, in fact, he got well known for doing the Christchurch Town Hall. That, that was his first uh, great success as an acoustician. So, we're working with good people on this. The, you know, the chamber itself was conceived as a finely crafted and highly tuned musical instrument. I suspect, I suspect most people say that when they design concert chambers, but... Um, and the idea was to harmonize the sculptural form and the acoustical quality. The interior of the foyer has an organic, more of an organic cave-like character with faceted forms and natural light falling from above. And again, you know, when you see the interiors of that house we just showed you, you can sort of imagine that on a kind of an epic scale, which, which would have uh, occurred had this been built. So we worked on this project for a couple of years. The mayor of Queenstown was a great champion for it, and um, I thought he was going to get his way, but... Um, even he struggled to herd the cats that made up his city council. And um, when asked by people about progress, I would always say that it was moving at glacial pace. But um, now I think I must concede that, in fact, the glacier is receding. The worldwide financial crisis hit Queenstown very hard, and it devastated a lot of the funding streams that this project was predicated on. You know, it's excruciating, the pace of these large public projects. I'm talking about snail's pace here. And it's very frustrating. And uh, I used to joke to the mayor, you know, after about the fourth year of this, you know, or fifth year, that um, I can see now why he chose young architects. Because, <laughs> because they've got to be alive long enough to see this thing through. So we live in hope. But from that, we'll go to a project which we're very excited about and is looking very much like it will be built, and very soon. Um, we are still in the early stages of this project, and it's been very, very, very well received by the school board, and we're proceeding with planning consent right now. Now, this is a new concert chamber and music school for Iona College, which is a girls' school in... Havelock North, a small town in the Hawke's Bay, the same place where the Tomata House is, which is on the east coast of the North Island. And it's, 
that wonderful scale of project which I think most architects love. And that's an intimate public building, a small scaled public building. It's set in a parkland setting in the grounds of this beautiful historic school. And the design touchstones that were included with this are the sensuous shapes of musical instruments, the asymmetrical rolling hill forms of the nearby Tomato Peak, and the rich materiality and the textures of John Scott's Our Lady of the Lourdes Church, which is, as I've said before, in the town nearby. And of course, there's our old friend Colin McCann with his abstracted landscapes. It's, you know, it's, it, he just keeps popping up. And uh, here are some early form studies which are moving from an angular idea to something softer and more elegant, something we felt was more appropriate for this. And we'll show you some pictures of, of the model. You can The materiality of that, uh, the copper roof features strongly. We really hope we can do this in copper. Copper is not cheap and it is getting more expensive. Um, there is cedar windows and door joinery and, and the, the base of it and the floor is in sandblasted concrete. So I'll just show you the plan. So you can see entering from the top right hand corner, um, that's the entrance which is sort of focused more to the entrance of the school itself. And this is the entrance to the school grounds I'm talking about. So this building can have some quasi-public function as well as just for the school. Uh, the foyer is the sort of fluid-shaped space in grey which links various other spaces together. And it looks out over the playing fields in one direction and over this kind of parkland in another direction. To the bottom right, there is a dance rehearsal or a dance studio and a, and a music rehearsal room. And then the main auditorium itself is in the centre. It seats about 400 people. And it prioritises music. You know, often with schools, when auditoriums are built, it's got to be multifunctional. So it's got to be very good for theatre and for music. So you end up with a proscenium arch, which makes the concert acoustics very difficult. In fact, I, th I believe, I believe the, um, the type is called compromise acoustics when you're actually trying to achieve both of those things. And what happens is you often don't achieve either of them very well. But one very refreshing thing about the school board is that they really wanted this to be about music primarily and non-amplified music specifically, as well as the school assemblies were also going to be held in there. Um, the school actually only has a role of 250 students, so uh, you, know, you can actually fit them all in there. And again, we worked with Marshall Day, the acousticians, and um, again, if you look at the uh, lower cross-section, you can see that the cross-section of the, the building is in fact asymmetric as well. And uh, we are working again with this, this, the same concept of dynamic symmetry, So that's a view from, from when you approach from the, the old historic school buildings. Yeah, and there's all our models, all put together. No sense of place whatsoever. So this is our work and this is our process and we're still learning. And we are still a work in progress ourselves. So... We value experimentation and openness, and we're very excited about what the future holds. So whether projects are small or large, urban or rural, we're trying to imbue each with a strong sense of distinct sense of place. Thanks for listening. Thank you.
You know, thanks very much. It's, it's a fabulous uh, talk. Just to, get, to go back to the genius loci and then also the critical regionalism, mm. some of the early interiors struck me uh, as the, the sort of more um, common, if you, know, uh, if you like, a regionalism that Siegfried Gideon talked about in, in later editions of, um, uh, of, of his work, uh, the, the sort of Brazil builds and, and Switzerland builds uh, mm. regionalism of the, of the sort of 60s and so on. Mm. And I think a, lo a lot of the strength of that work is really the, the fact that it, it is carrying a, a, a bundle of, of cultural knowledge, knowledge but within a, a reasonably frugal um, budget initially, so that there, there needs to be a real intensity in mm. the work. And uh, I, I think when you're talking about critical regionalism, not only being regional but being critical, mm -hmm. when Gideon talks about this sort of third stage of Buddhism, he's, he's talking about the, the, the streams of, of regional, regionalism uh, coming back with a vigour and, and with, a, with an intensity to, to, to reinvigorate, I guess, the mainstream. And, uh, and I guess that, that's the, the, the sense that I have looked at the work. It reminds me of some of the early work in, in Brisbane in the, in the 60s and 70s where there was, there was the same sense of, of modernity but also, also a drive to, to, to uh, contribute back that, that intensity. And, and I, I, it's not really a question, it's just really a comment. Mm. I, it's, it's really nice to see, to see that, that intensity of, of work and the strength of it. Mm -hmm. and, and the vigour of it that's grown from your own practice. Uh, are, are there other firms uh, in, in your uh, sphere in, in Auckland or in New Zealand that you think have the same uh, commitment to, that, to, the, to, the sense of, to the sense of place and the sense of identity that, that you work with? I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the touchstones of, of the Athfields and, and the John Scotts, I think, are fantastic. Mm. I mean, I, I think there are, there are others. Um, and a lot of people may have the talk, and but you know, like whether it's uh, realised or executed is not, you know, is sometimes a question. Yeah, but I mean, I think last year um, Dave Mitchell and Julie Stout came here, and they would probably be an example of people that were sort of in the same genre or exploring similar kind of ideas. You know, I mean, we've also got people in New Zealand just doing sort of out and out global modernism as well. You know, we've, we've got probably more of that than... We've got probably more of that, yeah, than, than this. 